Hello, everybody, and welcome back for another week of the Health Wealth podcast. We're going to be carrying on our health series today with the second part of diabetes. Uh, we're going to look at uh, how you can manage that and a couple more things as well as just a quick recap of what we did last week. And first of all, though, Barry is here with me again. So, uh, Barry, how are you doing? Doing great, Ryan. Thanks again for having me. Very pleased to be on and we'll pick up this uh, really vast and important um, topic uh, of diabetes and uh, how it um, manifests itself into major health problems how it can be avoided, how you can counter it, um, and how you can basically take control, uh, complete control without any medical intervention um, to prevent it. And if you have, if you have, if you are suffering from it, then how to actually resolve the problem um, by by implementing these strategies. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting into it. And um, but yeah, other than that, pretty good. Uh, I've just completed my first ebook which is going to get released next week so I'm excited about that and um, for my own course and um, obviously it's uh, it's that time of the year where your discipline starts to wane slightly with uh, Christmas coming up so I've uh, felt myself slacking off a little bit last few days with um, with workouts but uh, but um, no, I'll um, I'll get back to that next week. Um, it's easy to do, but um, it's uh, it's uh, this time of year. But um, I'll get back onto it um, from tomorrow. Other than that, yeah. pretty good. Good, good stuff. And yeah, and what one of the points as well that, that that we make a lot is that you know if you can just get on top of your, your diet and your lifestyle, and the way you eat, when it comes to this time of year at Christmas, you can enjoy yourself because you know that the rest of the time you're on top of everything. You know, you don't have to say, I can't join in anything. I can't enjoy myself or eat these foods that I want to anymore. It's, it's about, you know, staying on top of everything 90, 95% of the time. And then you, you come to Christmas and guess what? You can go enjoy yourself, have a couple of days here and there where you're eating whatever you want, and then you're straight back on it and and it's fine. You know, it's that that's one of the bonuses of, of living this way is that we can do that. So, you you know, People shouldn't feel like they have to be 100% strict all of the time because you don't have to be. You you have to do it the majority of the time and that allows you to have those days off where you can eat those things and, and then get straight back into it. So yeah, that, that's an important thing to make. It's, it's all of us, you know, it's no one's going to stay completely, you know, strict 100% all the time. You've got to allow yourself no. those, those times to indulge a little bit. No, absolutely. And, uh, and I do that... Uh... I do that intermittently as well. I talk a lot about building up credit with your body. You know, it's just a term that I use. You know, you're you're building up an inventory of credit so that when you do want to slack off and you do want to go and have a KFC, um, a, a big bargain bucket or what, whatever, a, a Five Guys or whatever, a Pizza Hut, whatever it is that you want, then you've already, you know, put in place a good period and foundation of healthy eating and being active so that you know you can you can just go and enjoy it without the fear of you know putting on that extra weight or feeling really lethargic and uh, obviously your body is in a much better position to deal with that um you know all those uh, the, the 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 treats that you have with carbs sugar whatever it is soft drinks you know that's okay as long as it's compartmentalized into a a certain occasion after a period of um, optimal living and then yeah. it's easier after that you've enjoyed it it's it's easier for your body to deal with it's easier to get back on the trail yeah and it's important to have that right mindset too because a lot of people it's a reward it's a reward That's yeah and a, a, reward a lot of people kill themselves and destroy themselves because they have that attitude that Oh, I've, I've, I've fallen off. I've had a tree. I might as well give up. But if you can have that attitude where, you know, I'm dialed in most of the time. So I, if I feel like eating that, I can eat that because I'm dialed in most of the time. And that that's the attitude and the mindset to have, because otherwise everyone falls off sometimes. And if you falling off means you're going to completely go off the rails, then you're not going to keep it long term. So yeah, it is super important to have that correct attitude and that mindset and and to understand that everyone's going to indulge at one time or another and it's completely okay. Just the next day you're eating properly again. 
and it's fine. So yeah, that that's good for people to know. Right, let's jump into. Um, I, I thought first off we'd just have a quick recap because this is kind of split into two. Um, of of last week, what we covered. Um, so I think we kind of covered first what is diabetes, which you know we discovered is you know as defined by various organizations is basically a condition of poor blood glucose control which leads to insulin resistance which you know leads to damage in in pancreas and in multiple areas of the body and basically leads to constant high blood glucose and that that's essentially a, a simple very basic idea of what it is um then uh, there was a difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes which was to begin with type 1 is you know too little yeah. insulin and type 2 is too much insulin although we talked about how eventually type 2 can become an issue of not enough insulin as well but starts off as one of too much and we talked about what causes diabetes which essentially is a high carb diet you know too much too much carbs and too much glucose in your body is what causes it despite the fact that there's still people that debate this and try and say it's not but you know it is nothing else is going to cause it um, facts. Hit, that's it's facts isn't it, it, it it's facts, facts. That's, protein is not going to raise your blood glucose massively and spike your insulin massively fat's not going to there's only one thing left that can do it and it's carbs so that's what it is and um, we ran through the history of diabetes as well and we covered what insulin resistance is um, yeah. which again is essentially you you having your high blood glucose all the time spiking your insulin is raised for a long amount of time and your cells essentially stop responding they're, they're full of glucose already they can't take any more they're just saying no your blood glucose is staying high you need more and more insulin to try and force that glucose out of the blood because it's a survival mechanism high blood glucose in the blood is going to kill you it's very bad for us so your body's trying to get it out. And so over time, you become insulin resistant. You can't get the glucose out of your blood. And then you have constant high blood glucose. And that's uh, insulin resistance leads to diabetes and many other conditions like heart disease and hypertension, cancer, and all other things. And we talked about what carbs are, just letting people know how much sugar is actually in foods. You know, we ran through a, a, a lot of items, you know, like an, an apple's four times the amount of blood sugar you'd want in your body at any one time and how much is in spaghetti and pasta and bread and things like that. Because... There's still people that think of sugar as in um, sweet things, chocolate and all things like that. And it, and it's not. And one of the things to bear in mind as well, which I, th I don't think I mentioned this on the podcast. I think it was when I was speaking to someone recently. And I said that one of the reasons that people don't associate uh, sugar with um, bread and pasta and all these is because they're not sweet. Um, and people associate sugar with sweet stuff. But glucose is not actually sweet. If anyone ever has to take a glucose tolerance test, where they put glucose um, in your, a little bit of glucose in your mouth and see how you react. It's disgusting. Fructose is the sweetness of sugar. Glucose isn't. So that's why fruit and things are nice and sweet because they've got lots of fructose and honey. But if something's just got glucose, um, it won't be sweet at all. So that, that's why not everything with sugar is sweet. It's only the, the fructose that is sweet. So that's why table sugar, sucrose, is half glucose, half fructose. If it was just glucose, it'd taste horrible. So that's just a little something for people to bear in mind. And then obviously we went through the mechanism of, type 2 diabetes um which as we said a couple of times is you know you're taking in too many carbs your blood glucose is going up that's then causing your insulin to be raised too much it starts to cause damage to your pancreas and starts to store fat in the liver and the pancreas insulin and glucagon stop talking to each other so your glucagon stays raised which means your liver is producing too much glucose itself as well as the exogenous glucose coming in and you've just got way too much glucose in your system insulin can't deal with it and you have um high blood glucose and that's essentially what happens and um, so i think that pretty much brings us up to speed yeah really well summarized ryan and uh yeah that was um they, they were they were the main the main topics that, that we went through last last uh, last episode so it's good to refresh that for uh, the listeners and um, on top of uh, following on from that we're going to uh, delve into um, something that's uh, that's really important about uh, tracking your levels um, and and what that entails so we're going to go into that um, you know target glucose levels and um, you know pre-meal and uh, HbA1c uh, things of that nature so um, 
would you like to give a brief outline first of of of, of level tracking? Right. Yeah. So this is really important for diabetics. Um, I mean, if someone wants to track their levels in general, then you know it's fine. I mean, I don't. If if you feel if you're having symptoms and you feel like you're you need to sort out your health, tracking's fine. Uh, overall. <clears throat> people get a bit bogged down with tracking. If, if you're reasonably healthy, it's, it's like the in thing nowadays, everyone's getting all these blood tests and, and trying to optimize all these things. But you know, your blood test is just a snapshot in time and it, people can get carried away. But for a diabetic, it's really important um, and, and is really huge for them. So if you're diabetic or pre-diabetic, definitely it's, it's important for you. So obviously we talked about um, what a CGM is in the, when we covered the, the different uh, phrases and different um, things. So that's a constant glucose monitor, monitor which I would encourage yeah. every single person who's a diabetic, if you've not got one, speak to your doctor and see if they can get you one because it's such a great tool because it that's will cool. just, it just helps you to understand the condition. It, it really does. But if you don't have one, then you should still try and test your blood glucose um, regularly. And you want to do it before and after meals. And this was actually, obviously, we said about people sending in questions, most of which are covered by what we're talking about. And this was one someone sent in. They actually asked about how long after a meal should you test your blood glucose. So normally you want to do it about an hour after you've eaten. So, you know, obviously before would be while you're still in a fasted state before you eat. And then after eating about an hour after you, you want to take it. So if you haven't got CGM, you should take before and after every meal so you can keep track of your blood glucose. Um, and, you know, just draw it up in a table, like breakfast was this and this, was I ate, before was this and after was this. And it allows you to see um, how you're responding to stuff. Not not as good as a CGM, but it still does the same kind of thing. So obviously when you eat a meal, you get a spike, but obviously we want it small. We don't want it big. So what you want to target is less than 1.7. Um, these measurements I'm using, what I'm speaking in are millimoles per liter. So, you know, there are different measurements, different countries can use different measurements for stuff, but this is millimoles per liter. So you can always translate it. So 1.7. So say you started with um, six millimoles before eating and then you ended uh, and then an hour later you were 7.5, then you've had a 1.5 spike. So that's less than 1.7. So you don't, if it's higher than 1.7, that's a big difference. And that's, that's not a good sign. Then throughout the day testing you want really to have a max reading of about eight so if it's going above eight especially if it's going above eight a couple of times that's not very good that's getting high you want it lower than that um and really before a meal when you're fasted you really want it below six if it's above six then for a fasted blood glucose that's reasonably high um compared to what you'd want it as i mean these are guides again we've talked before about levels and things and it doesn't tell you everything. So, you know, if you had one slightly above six, it's not the end of the world. It's just, you know, an average. And then when we talk about an average over three months, again, if you, if you haven't, we're talking a second about HbA1c, which gives you, a, you know, the average percentage over three months. But if you're just taking your blood glucose over three months, you want to have your average below 6.5. <clears throat> Cause obviously fasted, you want six and then below six after meals, obviously it will spike a bit high. So if you can get an average of below 6.5, then that's good. So they're kind of the targets in terms of uh, blood glucose. Because for diabetics, yeah, mm -hmm. good. Uh, excellent. And um, in terms of the HbA1c, um, would you like to break that down? Yes. So again, we covered that in our terms at, at the beginning of last week's episode. So. Yeah. What that is, is it's essentially a, a measure of damage to your red blood cells, to, to the proteins on them. Um, so the the higher your blood glucose, the more damage you'll have to them and the higher your rating will be. Again, it's not a definitive. There are certain reasons that it might be higher, but not as bad and might be lower, but but not bad. It, or, or could be low, but s s your blood glucose is still bad. So for the majority of people, though, it's a pretty good guide. Um, so red blood cells for most people renew over a three year period, a three year, three month period. Sorry. So it's, you only need to do it every three months. And it basically <coughs> tells you for the last three months, how good your blood glucose control was essentially. And it, it's 
portrayed as a percentage. So if someone's got a, a HbA1c of 5.5, that's 5.5% is, is what it means. So that's the percent of your red blood cells that are damaged. So okay. obviously the lower, the lower, the better. Um, and so again, we spoke about this before. A normal level is classed as below 5.5% and you're classed as diabetic if you're above 6.5%. So that, that's what you want to be. And again, it should be measured every three months um, because they, they renew every three months. Um, and every patient should know their own level. If, if you're a diabetic, you should know what it is and be tracking it. Um, and it's, you know, doctors use it to help decide what medication and, and things they should give. And it's a good measurement of your improvement. You know, if you're bringing your HbA1c down, then that means that, that you're improving. So that's essentially what what that one is so those are the two main things you should definitely be tracking if you're diabetic glucose and hbm1c and that uh, that brings us on nicely into um what modern day dietary advice is and what the the mainstream perceive that to be um which uh, i found really quite baffling um but uh, we're going to get into that so mm -hmm. Um, in terms of countering uh, things like diabetes, um, so uh, what would you would you like to run through um, what uh, what the the advice consists of uh, and the the measurements of the things we should be we should be uh, looking out for? Yeah, yeah. So, like you said, this is an interesting one because yeah, as essentially as we've already talked about with how these organisations describe diabetes. And even with the information that, that we're going to give you in a minute that they talk about in terms of diet and diabetes, everything they say points towards you. You're just expecting them to finish it off by um, recommending a low carb diet. Like yeah. everything they yeah. say is leading up to, yep. Okay. Yep. You're right there. You're right there. You're right. There. And then it gets to the end and they, and they're advising high carb. So it's ridiculous. So yeah, we'll, 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 we'll quickly run through some of it. So Sure. The, the the ADA, which is the um, American Diabetes Association. So this is this is some of the stuff that they have um, on, on their website, um, and th this is them talking about it. So this is their view on it. So they're talking about diabetes, and again, some of the stuff they they're saying is, is completely right, but somehow they translate this into a high carb diet. So they say your digestive system turns carbohydrates into sugar quickly and easily, which is correct. It does. Carbohydrates is the food that most influences blood glucose levels. So again, the, they say carbs turn to sugar quick. They're the food that most influence blood glucose levels. So surely we want to control them. The yeah. more carbs you eat, the higher your blood glucose goes. This is all what they're saying. Yeah. Okay, perfect. The it's higher it. your blood glucose, the more insulin you need to move sugar into your cells. So again, so far, everything they're saying is lining up with what we're saying. You know, brilliant. We're on the same, we're on the same sheet here. Yeah. Then it kind of changes. Then they jump to the food pyramid is an easy way to remember the healthiest way to eat. Now we know the food pyramid. It, it's not a very good idea. Now at the bottom of the pyramid are bread, cereal, rice, and pasta. These foods contain mostly carbohydrates and they advise six to eight servings of these foods per day. So the first half there, they've just ran through carbs, break down to sugar very quickly. They push your blood glucose up. The more you eat, the higher your blood glucose, the higher your blood glucose, the more insulin you need. And then they've just encouraged you to eat a ton of carbohydrates. It's how does it make any sense? It makes zero sense. There's no way to defend that. It's completely wrong. And then we'll come to, this was a, an official statement they made in 2004. So yes. they said low carb diets are not recommended in the management of diabetes. Although, what? Yeah. <laughs> Although dietary carbohydrate is the major contributor to post meal, which, which means after a meal, glucose concentrations, it's an important source of energy, water-soluble vit vitamins, minerals, and fiber. So essentially they say that carbohydrates is what causes high blood sugar, but uh, we still want them in our diet because they give us apparently a source of energy, which we can get from fats. Yes. Soluble vitamins much more in fats and um, minerals again fats and protein gives them and fiber which we don't need so they go on to say this is an agreement with the national academy of sciences food and nutrition board a recommended range of carb intake is 45 to 65 percent of total calories so that's more than half they're they're saying and then obviously if you're getting 
fats and and protein you, you know protein is normally around 15 20 percent so that leaves you like maybe at the 20 30 depending on what you go with 20 30 percent fats so basically you're having double the carbs that you have in fats which is super high it says in addition because the brain and central nervous system have an absolute requirement for glucose as an energy source restricting total carbohydrates to less than 130 grams a day is not recommended so that as well is completely and utterly wrong because neither of them well it depends. I mean, if they're saying an absolute requirement, as in the brain does need glucose, it has to have glucose to function. But as we know, our body produces more than enough glucose for the brain through gluconeogenesis in the liver, breaking down protein and fat. So th there's no need for exogenous carbs for that. Um, yeah. And, and, that, and it only needs a small amount. If we're fat adapted and we're running on ketones, which is the preferred fuel for the brain, all it needs is that small amount. Um, to run on and as we say five grams of um, glucose in your blood is all you need um, at any one time just five grams and the reason that your blood glucose is kept at that level is for your brain to work so if you're the reason that blood, low blood glucose is an issue is because your brain starts panicking because it needs that amount of glucose to function so if, if it lowers that's why if your blood glucose lowers and you're exercising you'll start to feel really tired and you're not actually tired, but your brain is telling your body to stop doing anything because it needs the glucose. And obviously it knows that your bre you need your brain to survive. You can stop using your muscles. You can't stop using your brain. Um, yeah. so, so that's why. So it wants to keep it at that level for the brain. And that's only five grams. Our liver produces that absolutely fine. No problem. So there's no need. So they're saying that we should be having at least 130 grams a day. Like, which is a ridiculous amount that's that's over that obviously last week we spoke about that the 20 year rule and you need just under 100 grams a day for 20 years to develop diabetes they're saying we no one should eat below 130 which is crazy crazy advice and yeah uh the only way that that i can make sense of it which i'm sure you might agree is because they just so happen to be very highly funded by the main um, insulin producers so that could have something to do with it yeah well there's a surprise yeah 30 grams above mm. the amount that you would roughly the amount that you would eat every day to develop diabetes and they want 30 gram, grams above that level yeah. and, um, and that's as a minimum that's as a as minimum, a minimum as well. yeah as a minimum um, crazy, asinine, uh, just to absolute, uh, I mean, it's, it's beyond, uh, that's beyond comprehension because some of the, the points that they made initially are correct and yeah. then they've almost done a 180 and they're pretty much, um, they're pretty much uh, advocating for um, the very things that cause these problems. Um, that's, the, that's what's so crazy about it. it yeah. is that the science is there yeah. and 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 they yeah. they've not even tried to change the, the science thing. yeah they've not even the, like the, been like okay let's let's the, change the science so it backs the, up our idea they've gone with this is the science this is how it works but then given the complete opposite advice it's crazy yeah yeah which is going to heighten your blood glucose levels as you say um telling you that 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 needs to be avoided but here's actually how not to avoid it here's how to make it even worse that, that's, that's crazy and uh, as what you said the big picture is they are funded by you know these these other companies you know the food companies and insulin producing companies as well and so they have an agenda to do that um but th this is why this information is so important but yeah yeah um as i said um baffling yeah it is uh, um the in terms of the, the the foods that you should avoid eating i mean we've obviously got um i mean there's one in here that actually sounds uh it it's it's the opposite of what sounds really really bad but actually the bad sounding thing is actually good for you and it's got the opposite we'll come on to that in a second but um would you like to run through a uh, the foods that you should avoid in order to to keep your your glucose levels low and prevent 
you know, the the, the chances of actually um, becoming diabetic. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, th this is just a really basic overview. There's lots of foods will fit into the, you know, these categories, but yeah. a basic overview. Basic, um, yeah. A basic overview, like sugar, obviously, we want to avoid, which is in lots of foods. Um, so, so any food that's going to be high in sugar, we want to avoid. You know, obviously, sweets, confectionaries, cakes, biscuits, all of this stuff, we want to be avoiding them. Um, and then we get on to, obviously, the things which, you know, don't come across as sweet but are full of sugar like breads we don't want to be having them cereals um pasta all all kinds of grains we do, they're all high in sugar now again if, if you're having a low carb diet you want to be keeping your uh, grams of carbohydrates below a certain amount so you know there are certain carbohydrates that you can eat and keep yourself below that but obviously the main ones you want to avoid are very high in in carbohydrates and so eating just a bit is going to take you over your limit. So that's why you avoid most of these. So I say pasta, rice, yeah. um, cereals, breads, all of this is going to take you over. Um, low fat foods as well, because yeah. the fat in food gives it the flavor. And so when they take out the fat to make it low fat, what do they put in to replace it? Sugar to make it taste nice. So don't eat low fat foods because they're going to be high in sugar and, and we don't want that. Um, processed foods. You know, basically anything that's coming with a bunch of ingredients and probably in a box packaged up, it's going to have sugar added to it. They're all going to have sugar added. They'll give it different names to try and hide it. But anything that's processed will have sugar added to it, along with things like seed oils and other additives and chemicals, which we'd want to avoid anyway. But yeah, and anything that's processed is is going to have sugar added to added to it. There's no avoiding that. that sugar's added to basically everything that's processed because, as well, it can help to preserve it as well as to to add the flavour. So definitely yeah. avoid them. And then, I, I know, oh, and on that, it's the high fat. It's the high fat that you actually want, not the low fat. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, in regards to the low oh. fat, as we said, we want we want the as we said, you want flavour on food and fat gives you flavor but they remove yeah. it and put sugar in so we want to take the sugar out and have the fat in to flavor it yeah. because the fat is naturally what's there and it's what's good for us and, and what we want so yeah we want to swap it out and as you say go for high fat options of everything you know if you're having greek yogurt full fat you're having milk full fat whatever it is you know full fat don't have low fat versions of it that they're, they're, they're bad and then <clears throat> kind of the last one on the list is probably the one you were referring to about where it can <laughs> where it could seem you know controversial to people but so whole fruits and vegetables some of them um are going to be okay whether if, if you're going for low carb there are certain ones that that are going to be fine but however there are ones that are high carb and so overall you want to cut down the amount of fruit and veg you're eating and aim for lower carb options because you know it doesn't matter that it comes from a fruit or a vegetable it's still sugar you know, that it's in your body, the sugar that you get from a biscuit, when it breaks down to glucose in your body, that glucose is exactly the same as the glucose that you get from fruit or vegetable when it's broken down into glucose. So it's the same yeah. the stuff that comes with it, obviously is different. You know, it's, it's not exactly the same in terms of everything, but you know, it sugar is sugar. So w when we're going low sugar, that it will include cutting back on fruits and vegetables, but you don't have to remove them completely. You can eat, um, if, if you're, eating the right foods you can eat a low carb diet and still have a reasonable amount of fruit and veg in if that if that's what you want to do and you don't have to reduce them to zero but it's picking the right ones which are low carbohydrate because some of them are much higher so yeah so that's that's probably the, the the last one as well for people to bear in mind yeah and that's something that i that i do on a pretty much a day-to-day -day basis as well that works really well to ha have that small amount of of, uh, of carbohydrates to, to try and get the right ones on and make sure the majority uh, of your of my diet is protein and fat and that if you find that balance then you can still um, you, you don't have to cut them out completely yeah and i think especially as well for someone like yourself if you're already healthy you don't need to go as extreme for someone who's no who's for someone who's really sick what they might need to do is go really strict for a while allow themselves to heal and then they could go to a more relaxed low carb approach so it, it's it's depending at where you are so so it, yeah 
that's why the earlier you do it, the better. Don't wait till you've got diabetes before you change it. Change it now, and then you can continue eating your fruits and vegetables. You can just stay low carb, and you'll probably be fine. But yeah. you know, don't don't leave it too late. So that that's an important thing to know is that the healthier you are, the more freedom you've got with what you do. Exactly, and the more leverage that you have to to make those choices. You know, as yeah. I said to somebody this week, it's okay to still have a bit of fruit. Have it at the right time. Have it once a day, and have it as a treat and make sure the rest of your diet is in place first. And then that negates, uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, that negates any issues happening. That it negates, um, decreases the chances of, of high sugar and glucose building up in your bloodstream. So, you know, it's all about, it's all about timing and having the foundations in place. It's not about complete eradication. But as you say, it is situational. And someone who is, is in a really, um, bad way um health wise may need to to go a bit more we may need to go more full on um and eradicate that completely at least in the short term and moving on to what uh what we should be eating uh, i mean i could talk about this stuff all day uh, but um again general list what what we should what are the majority of our diet should consist of yeah so you know, like we say, the majority of what your diet should be exactly as you summed up earlier, talking about yours is that animal products, you know, so meat again. And like we mentioned before uh, last week, when we we're talking good quality meat, you know, we talked about how chicken has actually gone up while all other meats have gone down as, you know, poor health has gone up. That doesn't mean chicken is responsible for it, but no. it's not as high a quality meat as the others. So trying to concentrate on quality. So things like eggs meats and trying to go for the fatty cuts um don't be scared of the fat you know as we mentioned with low fat you don't want to be scared of fat because as well as you go to a low carb diet what you're attempting to do is switch your energy source from carbohydrates to fat because you you know your body has two options you, you can use carbohydrates energy you can use fats energy that the human body is much better suited and much prefers using fat as energy but when carbs are present you cannot use fat as energy because, and the whole reason for this, which kind of is a very strong argument for why fat is the better energy source. <coughs> the reason that we can't use fat, I mean, you know, if we want to get real technical, you can still, you still burn a tiny amount of fat when you're burning carbs, but mainly carbs. The reason we have to burn that first is because the body's primary goal is to maintain that blood glucose level for our safety and for our health. And so essentially what the body is saying is when we put carbohydrates into our system, our body is saying, right, I've got to get this the hell out of my system. So, so clearly carbs are not what our body is wanting us to be full of, you know, it wants to get it out as soon as possible. So fat is the best energy source. So, yeah, absolutely. but we need to be eating plenty of fat in our yeah. diet for that, because that is our energy source. And if you can keep your carbs low enough, then your body will stay burning fat. That's why you, you eat low carb and you don't go over a certain amount. If you eat too much carbs, your body switches to carbs burning then you've got to get it back into fat burning mode so yeah don't be afraid of the fat nice fatty meat and um, fish and and seafood good as well as yes. like beef and lamb um and all of that then um you know dairy again and and all of these things are, are a rough guide for people and certain things will be good for some people and certain things won't dairy can be an issue for some people but if it's not an issue for you then it's fine it's good it's a good source of fat as well so things like butter cream and um, some cheeses again with cheese as unprocessed as possible like when we're saying with like um yogurt or milk or cream full fat for all of them you know fat as you can butter is is good that's great um so yeah da dairy is good but as i said if dairy is an issue for you then don't have it you know there's plenty of stuff on this list so you you use the things that you that work for you absolutely um, make it personal personal yeah. your situation and your tolerances exactly and like we said it comes back again to the how strict do you need to be you know what state are you in are, are you in a healthy state and you can be a bit more flexible or are you um a, a diabetic your hba1c is up at you know eight nine percent and you desperately need to get it down quick okay we need to be a bit stricter so it's all down to that and then fruit fruits and vegetables so vegetables leafy green vegetables yes are, obviously that's a very generalized statement but they are normally um low in sugar or it's called starch in vegetables that's how they store glucose as, as starch so 
they're generally pretty low. So, you know, broccoli, cabbage, lettuce, you know, um, uh, asparagus and things like that are, are generally low carb. So things like that are normally fine to have. Avocado is, well, technically a fruit, not vegetable, but that's good because as well, avocado is high in fat. So that's a, you know, if you're going to have fruit and vegetable in your diet, avocado is a great choice. So it's, yeah. it's low sugar, high fat. Um, that's a good one to have. Um, yeah. As far as fruit is concerned, obviously quite a lot of fruit is high sugar. You know, we talked about bananas and apples and other stuff, but ones that are lower in sugar, berries are good. M- most berries are, are, are low on glycemic load. So you've got strawberries and blueberries and blackberries and uh, raspberries and things like that um, are lower. So they're, yeah. they're good. And, and they contain a lot of uh, antioxidants as well, especially blueberries. So um, that's, a, that's a better option than, you know, your standard apples and bananas, etc. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, as, as we said, it's just making those right choices. You know, you don't have to cut fruit out. You can have some, but it's just choosing those lower carb options. And, and you know, as you say, they can come with some other benefits. And then there's also things like olive oil you can have and, and coconut oil as well um which you you can add to stuff and obviously you know we've mentioned this before when it comes to cooking i think cooking with animal fats is best because you know that they're not going to oxidize with olive oil it's olive oil has a much higher smoke point than most oils and it, and it sh- if it's a good quality um like cold pressed italian virgin olive oil you should be okay but most of them are not a lot of them are not and um, a lot of them are actually processed some of them even say that they are you know, actual Italian one, and then they come from Spain or wherever, and they've been processed, and then they could be unstable and could be oxidized at, at high heat. So I would still try and cook with um, animal fats. But if you put like olive oil, coconut oil on your foods cold, that's fine. I say you, you you could cook with them if you really wanted to, but I, I prefer to stick to animal fats just because, you know, you just take out that possible risk um, from them. And then another thing you, you yeah. can have, which is, which is low carb and and high in fat is, is you can have nuts, some nuts. There's something you need to be careful with because nuts are one of the few things that appear naturally and have um, protein, fat, and carbohydrate all in the one package. Most places are either, you know, protein and fat or, or protein and carbs. You don't really have all three together. Nuts are one of the few and they can be quite addictive. I've actually never been a fan of nuts, but I know for lots of people, you know, you, they get quite Moorish. So you need to restrict how much you have and, and have sort of fattier ones because obviously some of them are higher in carbs than others. So things yeah. like almonds and macadamia. Ca- cashews as well, I think are higher in fat too. Mm. So. Yeah. So again, it's just being careful with your choices. Um, yeah. And also, you know, as we say, you're aiming for low carb. So, you know, you might have, you're going to be in mostly animal products, meat, eggs, maybe some dairy, and then you can furnish it with a bit of vegetable or a bit of fruit, a bit of nut, but without going crazy on any of them. They're just a small part of it and um, that just allows you to keep that if, if you're targeting the, the low carb. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just to get that balance and, and to, even just to make, well, I, I, I'll use personally, I'll use um, small amount of vegetables and maybe a bit of rice as well, just to, you know, add a little bit more uh, of a mix to, to, my main or my main course or just make it a little bit more interesting there's nothing wrong with that as long as the the, the foundations and the the basis of it is from animal fats um and one of the other things just going back to the meat is uh, mints is is great especially like the, the the fattier mints not the leaner um you want you want it you want the percentage of fat to be higher so if you see that five percent mints it's not going to be quite as good as like the 10 or 15 percent so um you're going for mints which is great for uh, chili meatballs um burger patties uh, there's lots of things that you can do um with that and quite affordable too then try and get one that's just got that that, that higher percentage of fat it's more beneficial for you yeah definitely great. yeah uh that's uh i think that's that that was quite a, a lot there, and obviously we can go into even more detail on that. But um, yeah, I think that's uh, given everyone a, a great idea of what you should be eating and what you should what what you need to cut out, or at the very least reduce massively um, in your day to day um, your day to day eating habits. And um, yeah, that that brings us on to um, Verta Health studies and some some of the information about um, 
ketosis and and some of the some of the results that people have found. Um, so, would you like to talk about about, about that, Ryan? Yeah, so the Vert Health study was a, a big study. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head now. Rec- recently done uh, yeah. in two thousands. Um, Vert Health, they're, they're a big organisation in the in the US. Um, there's Steve Finney and I think Jeff Olek, uh, the people behind it. And yeah, so they did a big study of using uh, a low carb diet as an intervention in type two diabetes to to see um, how how it worked. In, yeah. in actual practice in, in patients and and the results were were pretty um outstanding so their aim was to with the diet was to get uh their patients into a nutritional ketosis um which is classed as you know between about 0.3 to 1.5 um ketones in your blood um as that, okay. that, that, different different people define it slightly differently but that's what they were defining it as for the study um, and so they did, uh, it was 12 months so it's for a year and um, they tracked, you know, HbA1c, weight, fasting, glucose, fasting, insulin, medication needed um, as they went through and got all their results. So 72% of patients fully reversed their diabetes in one year. Fantastic. With, with low carb. So 72%. So that's a crazy amount. And obviously you have to bear in mind that. Um, with most patients, well, pretty much all patients, diabetes is classed as um, a, a, an incurable illness and one that only gets worse. It's classed as a progressive disease. So that's not like, oh, 72% reversed it in low carb and, you know, standard care would have reversed 50%. Standard care doesn't reverse any. So that's 72% of the people reverse diabetes. 94% reduced or eliminated insulin. So again, that's nearly everybody has either completely eliminated their need for insulin or, or reduced it. They had on average a 1.3% um, lowering of HbA1c, um, which is great, which is, you know, so most people were as over 6.5 and then obviously 72% of them were then lower than it um, and almost back to normal. So 1.3% is a, is a big drop on average in one year. And um, as I said, for diabetics, things only get worse. So that only goes up. That doesn't normally come down. Yeah. Um, they had an average of 12% weight loss. So that's on average, people lost 12% of their body weight. So that's, um, that's a good amount. It's quite a lot. Yeah. That's, that's quite a lot, especially because the majority of these people were probably quite overweight to begin with. So that's going to be more than what 12% of our body weight is. So yeah, that, that's a good amount. And they also, um, tracked, um, their cardiovascular risk measurements because, you know, they, they track that because obviously, People say about high fat diet is is bad for your cardiovascular resist, uh, risk and, and heart disease. And essentially, patients improved on every single metric. So their risk was massively lowered by this diet um, on every single metric. The only And the only metric that went slightly up instead of down was LDL, which we don't think that's bad anyway going up. But obviously some people do with their lipid hypothesis and trying to blame LDL for heart disease, which we don't think that's bad. That was the only one that went up. Everything else, triglycerides down, HDL up, and every other risk factor um, massively improved. And obviously they've improved their insulin resistance, their blood glucose levels, which is a huge risk factor for, for heart disease as well. So massive, uh, massive improvements. Uh, so the conclusion was that the type 2 diabetes intervention demonstrated diabetes status improvements while improving many cardiovascular risk factors. And the data also showed huge improvement in sleep and also um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and liver function. So as we talk about um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is another precursor to diabetes as well as insulin resistance. So that's improved and their liver functions improved. So basically they've improved everything through their low carb diets and these organizations still refuse to um, accept that low carb diets are um, a good and, and viable option um, for treating um, diabetes. And then there's just one other study as well, which I want to talk about quickly, which was, um, yeah, it was about um, it was uh, basically called I think it was called like low carb diets in the wild, which was basically where they just they didn't tell people they had to eat a certain way. They just followed people that basically off their own back had eaten low carb diets um, across the space of again, I think it was a year, 18 months and seen huge improvements. And they basically tracked it and they they got them to draw up a list of the main things that really helped them to stick to it and to get improvements. 
And so one of them, the top one was hunger. So when, when they moved to a low carb, um, high fat diet, um, all participants reported less hunger, um, for, but for eating um, less food. So they were eating less food, but they felt full. And so, and so it was very easy for them to, to lose weight. And that's one of the great things because eating your fat and your protein, it fills you up because that's what your body actually needs on a, on a carb diet. You're starving yourself. Um, another thing they found really yeah, beneficial that's was... that's a really important point, yeah, about that, that it does satiate you a lot more than carbs. Yeah, exactly, and that's yeah. a huge benefit, yeah. and, that, and that, that's what they found. That's what helped them stick to it when in the past and other diets they'd failed. This one, they said, because of that. Um, also, intermittent fasting they used, um, and because of reduced hunger, they were able to eat less often, and obviously we've talked about before, there's so many benefits to intermittent fasting, so they, they used that. Um, addiction and cravings. So they had a positive outcome on, on food addiction and cravings as well, because they've removed that sugar from their diet, which is what they're addicted to. They're filling themselves up with protein and fat, and then their body starts to want the protein and fat and, and they removed that. So that made it easier for them to stick to it. Um, another thing was portion control. So they were able to not overeat. And we've talked about this before, again, eating proper real foods, it's almost impossible to overeat. You know, when you're eating protein and fat, as your main part of your meal, you can't overeat that. It's really hard to. I mean, you could if you really, really try, but it's hard. Um, yeah, yeah. And and you never experience that real bloatedness um, after it because the body, it it's, breaks it down so easily. Um, so even, even huge volumes of it and, you know, about, no, no better time experiencing that than a barbecue where you've just got or the ones that I've been at where it's just lamb and pork and beef and it's just it's a conveyor belt and you're just you're indulging um, but you're always you you you, you do feel full up then but you don't you don't you feel satiated and, and satisfied it doesn't actually weigh you down sit in your stomach yeah um, the way um, carbs do um, so it's it's a it is. It's, it's, it definitely is more difficult to 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 fill yourself up um, on on meat for sure. Yeah, it's a completely different feeling. Feeling, yeah. feeling full from having eaten a, a load of meat is you just feel full. Whereas feeling full from eating um, a high carb meal, you feel stuffed and you feel bloated stuffed, and you've yeah. got no energy and you have to sit down and and you don't get that with with meat. You just feel full. You feel nicely full, um, which is a mu much better way to be. Um, so also health related quality of life. So they had other benefits of, you know, not just improving their diabetes. They had more energy, increased mobility, lost weight, better mood. So all of these things, you know, they're eating the correct diet for humans. They're getting all these benefits. And so it made it easy for them to stick to this way of eating. And that's one of the things, it's not hard to stick to this way of eating. You get so many benefits. Why would you, why would you stop eating this way? There's literally just so many of them. Um, yeah, unless you've got a a desire to to for for feeling um, to, to 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 I would say a, a desire to make yourself feel terrible, um, or you know if you like feeling lack of energy, if you like feeling uh, depressed, or you, you you then there there's no way to go back to any other way of eating once you're on this once you're on this path because you just feel great all the time you feel energetic you feel vibrant your mental energy and your your clarity of thinking is is, is so much more heightened um and uh, and as well more mobility in terms of your your movement as well your data you just move a lot better as well through the world so um once once you 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 get on it then there's almost no reason unless you you want to feel terrible <laughs> yeah, to actually exactly. come off it and nobody exactly. wants to feel terrible do they um, no hopefully hopefully not no <laughs> no <laughs> yeah and so you know that brings us probably to the last point which was sustainability and adherence was one of the main things they like it's it's easy once you get started it's easy to eat this way it's easy to stick to it and because it feels so good you, you want to and so you know they were able to stick to it um, and and it and it worked and it and it does work and you know that there's there's no reason uh, not to do it. I think one really important caveat which I, I need to get into this episode is if you're a diabetic 
and you, you, you're currently being treated for diabetes and you're taking medication. If you've listened to this episode um, or the previous one and you think, you know what, low carb sounds like a good idea. I'm going to give that a go. Please talk to your doctor about what you're doing because while they might try and talk you out of it, which is the bad side, but you will need to monitor and lower your medication as you improve. So that's just saying really important. If, you, if you're not on medication, if you're maybe just pre-diabetic or you want to get your health in order, crack on with low carb. But if you're on medication, do speak to your doctor about it because as you start to improve your glucose control and you start to lower your insulin and, and, and lower your carb intake, you will need to um, reduce your medications. So, so please do um, speak to your doctor about it. Um, and as I say, some of them might, might be fine and might go long. Some will probably try and talk you out of it, but just let them know this is what I'm doing. Um, I, you know, just, just want to monitor things and reduce the medication as we need to, you know, together the, the dosage. So that's what I would encourage people to do. If you are going to do it, you know, you, you, you've got to be safe. And if you're taking medication, you, you need to speak to your doctor about it. Yeah, that's a really salient point there. Um, because <clears throat> as we mentioned, everyone's situation is different. And it could be that someone is on medication and that if they start to lower the amount of carbs, but keep, keep the, the same amount of medication, then that might have some sort of negative effect. So really important that everybody checks in with their doctor and um, before going down that route. Um, but um, for sure, this is a, a far more optimal way of, of living and um, just resolves so many so many issues with, with, with health. Uh, it, it really is all connected to this. So, um, yeah, great analysis, Ryan. And um, I'm sure everyone uh, found that really interesting, especially with the studies and the stories, the real life stories that, that we use to illustrate this. I think that was really powerful and I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. Yeah, exactly. That's the the most powerful and is the, the type of thing we like to use. You know, anyone can quote research papers showing this and that, but you know, this was a, a real life study. They've done yeah. following people and these people are eating this way and they are getting these actual results and it's working for everybody so it's not just a, a pie in the sky it's not someone's written a random paper saying this might work you know this works in practice and um, but as we say be careful speak to your doctor you know because you know if, if you lower your carbs and you're taking a lot of insulin it can lower your blood glucose too much and you can become hypoglycemic so you know you've got to be be careful so please do speak to your doctor and also um feel free to ask us and send in any questions you have around um, the, the low carb way of eating. And like we mentioned last week, um, January, we have another 30 day eating challenge and that's a perfect place to start to, to really start to get to grips with this way of eating and to get some help to do it as part of a group together, we're going to be supporting each other. There's going to be educational content in there as well to help you. And we're just going to take it step by step. There's going to be different goals each week. Um, take it step by step, improving, um, our eating and it, and it's, it's going to be really good. So that's a great place to start if you're interested. Yeah, for sure. And uh, to build on the, the great results that we saw the last time with, with the participants. So sign up. That's totally free. The link's there. And we will also be um, we will be releasing another uh, really uh, valuable free giveaway uh, in January as well. But uh, we'll tell you more about that in the coming days. Um, so stay tuned. And um, yeah, hope to uh, any any comments, get them in. Any questions, of course, write us and, um, you know, more than happy to, to explain anything further. But, uh, no, I think, uh, I hope everyone found that really educational. And, um, to, and, and obviously to take the most important things, to take the things and apply it to your situation um, or to, to your goals as well. Everyone has different goals and everyone has different situations. So it's important that... Um, everybody uh, takes um, takes uh, the important things that are, are relative to, to them. So, and um, keep getting the stories in and the questions on. Yeah, that's a great point to make. You know, you can, wherever you are in your journey, you, you can take this and apply it to where you are and, and have it help you. So that that's a great point. We'll share all the links in the show notes um, or below the video if you're watching it on YouTube. So you can easily um, access the challenge and our social medias if you want to 
ask any questions and we will see you again next week for another episode thanks again uh, barry for being here this week pleasure thanks for having me no problem it's always a pleasure to do it we hope that you were all well educated i hope you find that helpful and useful to your situation uh, we'll see you again next week and let's get optimal together